Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, special hangout on pitchinvasion.in. Uh, this is your old friend Anupam, and I have with me the author of A Brave New Pitch, and that is the other guy you see on your screen. That's uh, Samir. Samir, hi. Welcome to Pitch Invasion's Hangout. Hi, Anupam, and good morning. I, I guess it's the afternoon for you guys in India. It's bright and early out here in Brooklyn, New York. Yes, Five o'clock in the morning, in fact. It is. So, Samir, before uh, we, we're waiting for Gaurav to join in, and uh, before we uh, before he comes in, tell us a little bit about the book and the process. Uh, why did you decide to start, and uh, and and how long did it take you, and what's been the response like? Um, so, Arvind, the book came about as a as a result of some uh, you know of the sort of undeniable influence that you know I, the IPL and 2020 leagues in general have had upon world cricket in the past few years in the sense that you know many many folks that write in cricket have had a great deal to say about how much this could not just affect test cricket but in the way that cricket is organized across the world so i think there's been a fair indication that in many ways the landscape of the game has changed there were many changes coming to play we've seen the interactions uh, of um, you know, the influence of uh, television rights upon the way that the game is managed and run, about, about the influence of um, Indian control of the game, uh, especially the Board of Cricket Control of India. So there's been a lot of writing about this in various magazines and journals and websites all around the world, and I thought the time had come to perhaps try and put together a kind of comprehensive study of these, um, you know, of these effects and implications. It took me about a year and a half to write the book and put it together. Um, but of course, I'd been thinking and writing about this stuff for years before that. So it wasn't that difficult to process. I think it was more difficult to actually finish the book than it was to be actually writing it. Um, so I think in, in many ways, it was a difficult task because the game is changing very rapidly. And many times when I was writing the book, I felt... One of the things, one of the things that you mentioned in your book is what we'll discuss today. Yeah, yeah, of uh, course. On, uh, uh, you talked about IPL, its effect on, uh, on Indian cricket. Uh, yeah. on Indian cricketers and the landscape. Now, yeah. let me flip the question around to you. Okay, given yeah. the way India has performed for the last one and a half years, do yeah. you think Indian cricket is killing the IPL? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very good question because, uh, you know, in the, in the book itself, one of the, one of the sections I have is about the long-term viability of the IPL. Um, whether, in fact, the kind of influence of the IPL is having, up, having upon international cricket and domestic cricket is sustainable. And I think in India, at least, it seems to me, and this is a claim I make in the book, that a large part of the market value of the IPL and of the, and of the Indian player and of the kinds of salaries that Indian players get, and in fact, the, the way the BCCI runs this three-tiered auction, is about prioritizing international cricket, right? If you play for India, you make a salary that's much higher than play, players who don't play uh, uh, cricket for India. So obviously, this is done to make sure that you know national players think that the right thing to do is to play international cricket or play Ranji cricket and then play IPL. But obviously, part of the reason why Indian crowds go to see the IPL is because they are looking to see folks that have done well on the international arena come out and do well on Indian grounds against international opposition with obviously some Indian domestic players who haven't made it to the, to the, to the, international, uh, you know, to the international team as well. But a large part of the luster, the glamour, the, the, you know, the sparkle, the entertainment comes from the fact that you're seeing stars who have made it big on the international stage and it doesn't seem to me sustainable that if the Indian team just continues to do badly over a period of time that the IPL can have the same sort of appeal for the Indian player um, as it does at the current moment. I mean if you think of when the IPL was started, it was started in 2008 after we won the T20 World Cup, right? I mean why wouldn't it have had a spectacular start? We've done well in one day international cricket over the past few years. Uh, there was some flattening out in the yeah. So are you saying are you saying, Sabir, that given given the fact that India won the T20 World Cup and that led to the success of IPL, India's 2011-12 seasons will have the same kind of negative impact on the IPL this year? Um, it it might not be an immediate impact. I mean, the Indian fan is a very faithful fan. I mean, you know, despite all the talk about the fickleness of the Indian fan and how quickly, you know, they dump their team when the team does badly, uh, they don't tend to stay away from the stadiums. You know, uh, they, they'll still come in, pack the stadium, and, you know, they might throw, you know, rotten fruit at the, at the players, but they'll still come to the stadiums. I think my worry is that 
there might come a point when a, a couple of years down the line, if you know, if the slide isn't arrested, that they start to lose interest in the game, because it's the kind of sports market we're in now is not a market that doesn't offer alternatives. I mean, there's Formula One, there's EPL. Uh, you know, now we have a new hockey league in India. Uh, you know, it's it's not the kind of market that Indian cricket could count upon on the 80s and 90s when, you know, cricket was the only big game in town. So I, I, I don't think we'll see this effect this season or maybe even next season. But if we keep on getting seasons like the one we've just had, then I think we'll start to see this effect play out. Okay. So you're saying that if, if, this, uh, if the deterioration of Indian cricket continues at the same rate, in a couple of years, IPL could be dead. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's it's something where I don't think it's going to have the same sort of appeal for its advertisers, its sponsors, you know, the folks who buy advertising during, you know, during the IPL's time slots. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't know what the, I don't know what the TRPs are, you know, for, you know, for the Indian team whenever they do badly. But I mean, over the past few years, we've had a, you know, we've had a pretty good run. We did win the World Cup in 2011. It's just in the last two years that we've gone completely south with these horrible defeats in test cricket one after the other. Uh, so it, it, it's. I think the big question for me is to see is whether this continues or, or whether the slide actually gets arrested or not. Okay, I'll take uh, I'll take questions from Pushkar and Surya in a little while. Uh, other watchers, listeners, audience, spectators, uh, please feel free to uh, to send in your questions on Batter Banter. Uh, Samir. Yeah. Uh, what I wanted to know was uh, you've talked about. Uh, the slide leading to uh, you know lack of commercial appeal for IPL, but yeah. if you if you see uh, you know BCCI is, is you know lack of commercial BCCI has pretty much uh, covered its bases because they've sold rights for the next few years. Pepsi yeah. has bought rights at twice the rate of DLF. I am right. aware that sponsors are already lining up for IPL. The yeah. media rights have been sold for ten years in advance. Yeah. So yeah. if you look at it, uh, whether people come to watch or whether people watch or not is immaterial because BCC has already secured all its money. Yeah, sure. So, and I think that's a, I mean, I think that's a very good point. Um, the BCCI uh, shows a great deal of strategic vision when it comes to selling the media rights for the IPL, right? Uh, you know, let's go ahead and make sure that we sell the media rights for 10 years. Let's make sure that we cover our bases in such a way that our long-term interests, our long-term economic interests are taken care of. Um, I, I guess one question is, whose long-term interests uh, are being taken care of? Is it the current lot of BCCI office holders whose economic interests are being taken off? Or is it the long-term economic interests of Indian cricket as a whole that are being taken care of? Right. I mean, I, I could, you know, yeah, you could say bases are covered, but it seems to me the bases that are covered are, are those just on the BCCI, right? Um, five, ten years from now, you know, when you've had, when you've sucked in, you know, some of the best domestic players off the circuit, um, uh, compel them to play in the shorter form of the game, uh, not care that much about the longer form of the game, then, you know, we might have an IPL for the next ten years, perhaps. But I would like to think that sports leagues and sports franchises or businesses don't think in terms of just the next 10 years, unless, you know, you're, unless you're thinking of this as just a quick gold rush economy, you know, where you get in for a few years, make your big bucks, and then you head for the next startup venture. I mean, if that's the sort of mentality that folks involved in the IPL have, then I suppose those sorts of economic interests are taken care of, but it doesn't seem to me that the game's interests have been taken care of, right? So yeah, exactly. you could say, you've sold, you know, we, we sold media rights. Um, and, you know, these media rights are not subject to negotiation, you know, even if the number of eyeballs don't go down, you know, that we get paid regardless of how many people are watching or not, or, you know, whether these contracts can be tweaked or not. So perhaps everybody involved in the current uh, uh, deals are happy. Um, but, if the, but if the viewership rates aren't good, if the stadiums aren't full, then I don't think the same sort of media rights will be negotiated down the line. And, of course, that's not good news for a league which hopefully aims to more than just, you know, being a five or 10 year phenomena, right? I mean, of course, there are tons of leagues that are, I guess what yeah. happens is the, the BCCI people, they themselves know that they are in for a short term of, of yeah. a limited number of years, and uh, they don't care about what happens after they're gone, as long as they've yeah. made their money till then. That's my reading of it. Let me quickly uh, catch up on some other banter. Pushkar is sure. saying, hello, haven't read the book, but look at looking at the description in Flipkart where Sami talks about nation-based cups replacing nation versus nation 
yep, yes, Pushkar, I'm holding the book in my hand. It's a very good read. Go ahead, order it on Flipkart. Uh, Samir, question for you. Yeah. You talk about uh, nation-based cups, replacing nation for nation. In a uh, in very simplistic form, uh, what is the format that you are recommending or uh, kind of crystal gazing? Well, I think one thing that I have in mind, which I spend a lot of time talking about, which the possibility the IPL raises, is that uh, we might move away from uh, the current format of the game, which is the ICC. I am okay. You see me? Uh, there's some disturbance. I lost you for a okay. little while. Okay, yeah, it's better. Uh, so I think the what I talk about is that. Uh, the current format, which is ICCI with a bunch of national boards, uh, you know, which I describe as a cartel in uh, in the in, in the book, you know, they, they have a pool of players that play for countries, w might be replaced down the line in the way that we have, um, you know, the, the the situation in soccer where we have a bunch of professional clubs who play the game for the majority of the year with nation-based football taking up a smaller part of the calendar as as. as and I thought one of the big advantages of this for players in particular, and, and of course for fans as well, is that, uh, is that A, players will be able to play not just for their country, but for any club anywhere in the world, much like professionals like us do. Um, you know, for instance, um, you know, if I'm a software professional or if I'm a doctor, I don't just have to work in my country, I can work elsewhere as well. And, you know, I think this is a possibility that was opened up once we saw the franchises of the IPL. And then it started to seem to me that it might be better for the players if this was the case, because you know, I mean, if you look at the Indian, uh, if, if you look at the Indian cricket scene, there's only Indian, there's only 11 players that can play for the Indian national team, and and you know, for, for a nation of one billion, the rest of the players simply have to compete for the scraps, you know, on the you know on the nation's domestic circuit, right? I mean, I I, I wrote this article on Cricket for uh, I think a couple of weeks ago when I said, you know, from the perspective of cricket. The creation of Pakistan was a good thing because that means that 11 more players can play national level cricket. If we had just one country, we'd have 11 players playing for the entire subcontinent, and in fact, there would have been 11 fewer international slots, right? Now imagine a world labor market made up of clubs playing cricket. Players could earn a living not just by playing for the country, but for playing for other, uh, you know, but for playing for other slots as well. So I think that's I think that's one thing that I found very promising about the about the T20 franchise model. And you know, one thing thing that I talk about in the book is that franchises don't just have to play T20; they could play one-day internationals, they could play test matches. You know, we had Kerry Packer's World Series cricket, where we had the Kerry Packer Australian eleven playing against the WSC West Indies eleven. Those guys played actual super tests. They were five-day games, and they had very good players playing for them. I was a I was a 12 year old in those days, and I followed those games with great interest because the world's best players were playing for them, right? And that's what mattered. What you really cared about was the quality of the cricket, and not necessarily who was organizing the game, right? Uh, yeah. there, there was an so, Indian uh, team. Yeah. So Samir, Samir, what you are recommending, what you are not just recommending, you are saying that it's possible that in the future it will be more on the uh, you know football format where 80 percent of the of the cricket that you play is for your franchise or club and 20 percent for your national and it, uh, franchise cricket need not be restricted to only t20 uh, let me quickly catch up on what uh, uh, thing thing was bookies fixing matches now it's worse because boards have started doing it okay there's a third screen there I'm wondering is that got up hi uh, can you you can't see me but can you hear me now Yes, 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 Gaurav, we can hear you. But uh, unfortunately for all the female viewers, all the 23,000 female viewers, they can't see you. Uh, I've, I've, I've just got into too much technology today. I ran into a tablet and I was trying to figure that out. So that didn't happen. And uh, so I'm, I'm grappling with uh, good old Windows now again. Yeah, That's hi, right. Sumit. Right. Uh, Gaurav, OK, I, because you joined in late, I'll pose the same first, uh, first question to you that I did to Samir. Forget Boy, so, IPL killing Indian cricket, yaar. Is ah, Indian cricket killing the IPL? Uh, I, I wish it was the case, but go, going by all the selections that we've seen in the last one to one and a half years, it hasn't happened and I doubt it would happen. If uh, Indian cricket, uh, it's such a tongue twister of a question, but if Indian cricket uh, was killing the IPL, you'd have a lot of selections uh, which aren't happening. Uh, you'd have Chiteshwar Pujara playing today, which he isn't. I mean, uh, forget the fact that he scored a triple hundred yesterday and maybe even 
just got about 14 to 16 hours of a break between the one day and uh, the first class Ranji game yesterday. But if you have a guy who's scoring so prolifically, you'd possibly just pick him in. And or you'd have a plan in place where you said, listen, you don't have to play that quarter final. We have a problem. We want to address it. And the problem is that we are barely lasting 50 overs. India is faced with such a problem today that we at times do not play 20 overs in a T20 game. Yet, we uh, continue to ignore the fact uh, that there are guys who are not maybe doing well in IPL, but are doing well in, say, domestic cricket and yet are not picked. So the sad, the sad bit is uh, the IPL is, uh, is, is jacking uh, Indian cricket. It will continue to jack Indian cricket. But the fact is that it already has done it. So what will happen from here is, uh, you know, it, it just keeps going on and you possibly see a lot of people who are controlling Indian cricket destroy each other like happened with Lalit Modi before. And you, you'd have a new fall guy within the, the people who, who run Indian cricket, you know. So it's, it's not very different from uh, the way the government is run today where, you know, the government of India, where you, you basically, uh, you will find someone who you can do in. And the next thing is the BCCI continues to roll on. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, Sameer, we, uh, the discussion has moved towards the current state of, uh, of, of Indian cricket. Thanks no, to uh, <laughs> Gaurav. And, and we will stick to it because that is something which is pressing us uh, a lot, you know, the way uh, what's happening. So, Gaurav, if you were to select 11 players for today's match, whom would you have selected? Uh, for one, I would have dropped Gautam Gambhir purely on form. He's, he, yeah. You're not... You're, yeah, I, I would have... Yeah, I would have picked Chateshwar Pujara and made him open. What India doesn't realize is that what they're doing with Gautam Gambhir and Virendra Sehwag is no different from what they've done with Rohit Sharma. If you continue to pick a player who is out of form, who is not scoring even double digits in one-day cricket or for India, you have to get him back. Now, the fact is that he could have scored a triple or a hundred while he was playing for India. But you still uh, rush him back. They did this with Murli Vijay previously also. Now, Murli Vijay, I feel, is a very strong contender, uh, purely by the fact the way Indian cricket functions. You know, we know there is a coterie in place, and there will be certain players who will always come back. You know, there was a time you could say that, okay, we, we, you know, we're just conspiracy theorists, but it just seems so blatantly obvious that what we see is what it is. You know, a few years back, we could feel that the way we are being run into the ground as a people of this country is, you know, which, these are just conspiracy theories. But when it continues to happen all the time, now you either say, listen, let us be part of this conspiracy also and get some of our people in, which is what I guess when they're sitting in Rajkot, they would be saying, okay, why can't we have this guy playing in? But uh, what, what they continue to do is play Gautam Gambhir into the ground like they did with Rohit Sharma. Now, Rohit Sharma uh, could possibly have a better chance maybe taking a year just playing domestic cricket other than sitting on the bench. He's doing nothing really. He could make a really good 12th man, which he does. Now, it is ridiculous that all of us know that Rohit has such great potential. We know he can time the ball, but the moment the poor guy comes on, he just, they're incredulous, the kind of shots he plays, he looks as if he's never played cricket before. No, you're, you're wrong there, Gaurav. He's our best batsman in the nets. Yeah, that's what Gambhir said. Now, now just see, Gambhir went on and on, and he just, he became a, a man, a, a talking machine of cricket, and here you're talking about an extremely withdrawn, quiet, studious cricketer. I'd possibly... You know, a couple of years before the slowdown in Gambhi's batting happened, I'd say he was our most reliable guy. And just see the way the guy has been ripped into. He cannot play. So you've got Gambhir, who's going the Rohit Sharma way. You've got Seva, who pretty much went that way. And what they possibly might be uh, seeing now is Rahane, who seems extremely conservative, who, who plays behind the wicket pretty much like Gambhir. Both these guys just play to third man. Rahane is a guy who we saw in the IPL of all things, play like a perfect batsman, always in, you know, in front of the wicket, in the V, he was almost like a mirror image of Rahul Rabbit on the other side. In fact, a lot less square I heap. And here you have this guy, and I shudder to think what Gambhir and uh, Rahane would look like when they come on to bat after the break, because here are players who don't expect them to play themselves into form. Now, obviously, something, some malfunction has happened in 
in their minds you know i don't I don't even see this as a uh, as something which is uh, purely ipl it's it just seems very political and i i think it's good that someone speaks about it and addresses it then you have people who say that you know the various coteries and various groups and blames the bcci let me, because let me understand they, yeah. let me let me understand what you are saying is that for years shrinivasan and the tamil nadu cricket association pushed their favorite players in and now it's the chance of the others to get back saying since you pushed this guy for all these years you have to keep my guy and everybody is saying that look your guy is coming in my guy also needs to come in and this this used to happen for the last 30 years or more and you're saying that this has become a lot more uh, like a lot more of a criteria now uh, anupam what is scary is it's not just uh, the tamil nadu the southern zone which is in play you're talking about csk which is in to play so you may have some players uh, like dinesh karthik who could play for uh, tamil nadu he doesn't get a look in but at times saha does because he csk it it works on so many different levels because i think the franchise is a lot stronger than the state today and which is why i feel that all the players who are in india in the indian 11 represent some franchise or the other i mean this years back used to be the way the colas or the guys with the mega box used to operate but now what we've got is the ipl franchise has become ipl cola and you have these guys who just i mean there are a lot of people who are pretty good also because i'm sure if you can play in the ipl you you should be playing t20 and one day cricket because there is something but the same guys do not cut through to test cricket and it always works the other way around now if you could consider pujara and say listen we can take this guy into one day cricket it 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 wasn't such a huge jump as in pushing him into t20 i realized the guy hasn't done too well in the ipl maybe i think the best thing uh, they could do is listen you just have to show your face you could be the future of indian cricket but you don't have to go slam bang in uh, ipl mm -hmm. okay kushal kushal is saying and something very interesting he says i know how rohit sharma feels i scored 100 on 100 in maths in prelims and screwed up in the boards <laughs> yeah Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll, Samir, now, Samir. Yeah. I, what do you think I, of what do you think of what uh, Gaurav is saying in terms of the conspiracies and conspiracies? Not state boards, but essentially each player in the Indian side is representing some franchise or the other, and franchises want their players to be players to be pushed into the Indian side. So okay, I think that's a, I mean good question. I mean, first, I think there's a cricketing aspect of it. I think this is one of the things that Gaurav was getting at earlier. which is that this constant inclusion of players who are out of form and asking them to play the international level is is terrible from a cricketing point of view uh it's terrible to expect them to play themselves back into form when they're so stressed out about their current level of form that the best thing for them to do would frankly to be to get some time away from the limelight and to go back and to play in the domestic circuit for a little time and i think it's worth remembering you know two of the biggest success stories in international cricket uh Justin Langer, Damian Martin and Matthew Hayden were three batsmen who all started their test careers as promising batsmen they had failures they were dropped they went back into the wilderness they played in the domestic cricket they played themselves back into form and they came back and they had amazing careers right i think it's worth keeping these three examples in mind and i think one of the things that really alarms me is every year we get a brand new promising player who comes up bursting with talent who gets shoehorned into the international side sometimes quickly sometimes it works out sometimes he's given a couple of chances a year or so later he's gone we we never hear about this guy again utappa's gone vijay's gone badrinath's gone i mean these guys keep coming this this an assembly line we keep producing them they just keep getting lost one after the other i have no idea what happens to these guys they get they just get disappeared i mean kaif is a very long story but i mean i just don't understand how selection works and you know i think it's a complete byzantine problem uh the other thing is the involvement of the franchises i think the most disgusting thing happening in indian cricket today frankly speaking is this whole shrinivasan business uh the the a man who is so powerful in the bcci has a controlling interest in a franchise in clear violation of the bcci charter this is clear clear conflict of interest but yet this is the biggest it's the most open secret in indian cricket uh i mean I mean, if you think about the charter of the BCCI, what they're supposed to be doing, um, the guy has control of this property in India, and he's essentially extracting monopoly rent from it from six weeks every year. He's been given this property as a public steward. Uh, that you know, here is this property that belongs to all Indians, and we want you to administer it on behalf of all Indians. What does he do for six weeks? He just rents it out and 
and, and derives all this commercial value from it in a way that is explicitly forbidden by the charter. Once that happens, again, commercial interests yeah, have to enter in, into the team selections. Again, I mean, I, again, I don't know how they'll like, beast, really, because uh, Lalit Modi had created it under Sharad Pawar and he's only continuing it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, uh, I, I think, I think, I think Srinivasan is tapping into something which I think Modi had kicked off. I mean, I, mean, I think Modi realized very quickly that, you know, we are sitting on this pile of gold, right? And, and what we need to do is to kind of just open the door a little bit, let these commercial partners come in, exploit it, you know, so that they can, you know, so they can make money and we can enter into this partnership from us. Um, and of course, I mean, once these, once these sort of commercial considerations come into the picture, then of course you have this kind of, you know, th then you create this ground for the kinds of conspiracies that Gaurav is talking about, which is that, you know, are certain players playing in the national team because, uh, you know, because doing so would, you know, would improve the commercial appeal of the franchise, which is interested in having an international player on its ranks. And of course, which then brings us back to the question that I was asking about earlier, is the player who's playing for your franchise a successful international player or is he merely an international player, right? And it might be that Indian crowds right now start to make, uh, right now are making a kind of, uh, or might land up making a distinction between T20 IPL in such a way that, you know, they don't care that much about test cricket or they don't care that much about one day international cricket and that this is just a separate form of cricket that they will pay attention to in its own right. You know, much like college students will pay attention to the university team, regardless of whether the Indian team is doing well or not. Right. So, I don't know if that stage has been arrived at as yet, um, but I think there are patterns. You know, there there are patterns in this sort of uh, selectorial incompetence or management that I think all cricket fans have noticed over the years. So let me let me uh, pose the same question that I did to you to Gaurav. Gaurav, uh, yeah. this IPL, given how India has performed in the last one and a half years. Do you still see people lining up to watch matches, going crazy over IPL, TRPs hitting through the roof, etc.? Uh, I, I, I'm going to answer that. Uh, I just wanted to go back to something Samir said where he talked about Hayden and Martin. Now, I find that fascinating that Australia had these guys come back. I, pretty much a lot of these guys make their debut for Australia when they're 30, which is, I mean, Hussey, I think, made his debut very late for Australia. And look at the seven, eight quality years that you can give a team. And we had this opportunity with a player like Badrinath, which we continue to squander. Whether he comes good or not is another thing. But to say that this guy could be the finished deal or the real deal when he comes in at 30, just imagine what you've gone through. Now, if you were to read Manoj Tiwari's tweets on uh, on Twitter, he seems to keep some semblance of sanity in spite of what that man might have gone through. Just imagine if you were Manoj Tiwari, what I, I, I think... Uh, you, you'd possibly uh, need a full-time uh, trainer shrink, you know, you'd, you'd need him to uh, to possibly, uh, you know, uh, ease your brain muscles and say, listen, it's, it's all okay in there because uh, what they are putting players through is they're finishing them. Now, uh, you, you, can, you can finish a, a player, especially on the bench. And what is fascinating with Martin Hayden Hussey is that these guys, they might have been waiting, but they weren't waiting on the bench. They were waiting playing first-class cricket. Uh, Coming to your question, uh, Anupam, which I seem to have uh, forgotten in the haze of my answer, <laughs> or rejoining what? Uh, hey, could you just uh, repeat it, please? Uh, are, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, I, I think they'll still they'll still come in because uh, what what has happened is it's become a family outing. Maybe it always was a family outing, and uh, when the IPL does happen, and I make it a point to go for a couple of games because it connects me to to something. Uh, like maybe having gone to Nirula's, you know, for an ice cream in summer. So it's it's part of an outing, really. And what I do in the IPL is I watch people. I love to people watch because people are, are actually, yeah. Especially people who are called cheerleaders. No, <laughs> not that fascinating. And uh, I, 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 I mean, I, I like watching the people who are watching the cheerleaders because they... they you know those i mean it's 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 a lot of drama i i, I see a lot of uh, like there was this uh, kid who was and we were in the 10th row where kp was uh, you know st standing on the boundary and he was taking a photograph then now he didn't have a very strong camera but you know you, you the first thing you want to tell him is listen go a little closer you'll get a better photograph and the the entire mela around the ipl is that so these people 
uh, will continue to come and uh, I, I don't know how much they're following the cricket more than a few players. So I, I, I noticed that KP was pretty much the buzz this time because he's a huge name. He, he plays to the galleries and uh, he loves it. So the, the entire thing is it's becoming very similar to what I guess people who watch the WWF or that kind of musty. You know, it has become, and you cannot tell people who are into the musty of cricket that, boss, this is not cricket, because they're not into buying that. Now, it might irk, uh, the, you know, the three of us that, hey, wh what is the IPL doing? So it continues to be a, a successful model in some sense. I mean, which which is bewildering. We, we expected that, listen, what is happening to Indian cricket? You know, you should be jacked. I mean, I really hope that, you know, they, they were to uh, release some of the main players, let them play fewer games. But I guess uh, even Sachin Tindulkur, he doesn't score runs in the IPL. He doesn't score runs in the CLT20. I mean, he was abysmal in the CLT20, but nobody watches the CLT20. So it's not as if they're going to take his report card and say, or Raul Dravid is not going to say, like he's saying, uh, you know, maybe Dhoni should retire as CSK captain, which is a ridiculous thing. I mean, what world is Rahul Dravid living in? You know, I read some of his stuff and I feel, is he part of a you know, CSK conspiracy? Because everyone who speaks is speaking Shastri tongue. I mean, how many people, what does it take to come up against Dhoni? I mean, this man cannot play test cricket and he will continue be, you know, to be the test. And he makes me, you know, I can hear it in my voice. I'm getting agitated. Why should I get agitated about Dhoni being captain? But because Dhoni is the CSK captain and Dravid, for some strange reason, expects him to drop that, which is ridiculous. He will never drop that, he, which means if he is CSK captain, he will continue to be the T20 captain. And because he's a good one-day player on merit, he should be the one-day captain. And well, the test job, you can just walk in and walk out. He is amazing on autopilot. I have not seen a more incredible spokesperson in India than MS Dhoni. I mean, I sensed it a few years back that this man will make a great politician and he is going to. He can run for prime minister one day. I mean, he possibly has everyone eating out of their hands. This guy is, he is a phenomenon. He is everything what Sachin Tendulkar could not be. Sachin Tendulkar did not become a successful captain. This man, in spite of being an unsuccessful captain and having done everything, has the credits, the custom credits of that era on him. So this is like going to the casino and saying, I've just, you know, sold my yacht and uh, I've uh, put Draupadi there also on the line. But if the Pandavas have so many credits, they can go on to possibly sell the entire country and the credit. And this is what this man can continue doing. Because you're talking about the face, the phenomenon. He's, you know, dudes will always go on. He's a biker dude. He is, uh, uh, he's a man who speaks every bloody language. You know, he, he is conversant, communicative. It doesn't matter who or what he puts down. So what you're facing is possibly the BCCI, which is uh, largely faceless with Srinivasan, with the king, the queen, juxtaposed as one player. I mean, which is why cricket will or can continue to get jacked, but you've got the backing of, you know, Rahul Dra Dravid on his 40th birthday. I mean, I, I, I find it uh, blasphemous, the kind of stuff that everyone is saying. You know, that article was not written by Ravi Shastri, but by Rahul Dravid. And I'm sure he has, because one year down the line, we could be saying, uh, you know, he told us so. I'm saying maybe it comes good because it just seems like a very bad time and everyone does realize that there isn't anyone to possibly captain. But, I mean, unless you take a chance, I mean, you could captain anyone because it can't be any worse. But because you said there is no alternative, okay. you don't go anywhere. Achha, Paji, two minutes ke liye, aap shant ho jao. Pani piyo, pani. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, but but good to see that there's so much emotion. Yeah, still I become indifferent. I don't care what happens with this team. I'm I am you speak you speaking all the time, man. I'm I'm possibly yeah. coming on your show for the first time. So yeah. So I, I think I, I think that I, I think that word is very interesting, Anupam, because I think you know when you say uh, indifferent, I think I, I think I think that's one thing that should worry uh, folks that follow the game in India because. When people become indifferent to the game, you know, you know, those of us that have followed the game for a long time, even when we talk about indifference, I think what we mean is a, is a certain kind of benign indifference in the sense that, you know, we're sort of turned off, we're disillusioned, we're not paying as much interest to the game as we used to. But, you know, the moment the, 
the moment the team starts doing slightly better or we see some chances for redemption, we'll tune back in immediately. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm burnt out a great deal, but I still find myself paying attention to the games out of the corner of my eye. What I'm more worried about is those folks that are on the edge, that are thinking about where they should spend their time and their money, where they should spend their entertainment rupees or dollars, uh, who when they surf channels, find the EPL on one channel and find Formula One on another channel, and they find perhaps, you know, Indian golfers or Indian tennis players or, you know, or just other players from other countries, um, they might not pay that much attention to the game anymore. And I think that's what I'm worried about. I'm worried about uh, people who maybe, you know, in the case of the IPL, just dissociate the IPL, you know, in the way that Gaurav was saying, you know, it's a local tamasha. You know, you go there, there's music, you know, there's cheerleaders, you know, there's a, you know, there's a, you know, there's a band baja and there's a, you know, tamasha in the stands. Um, and, you know, that's what I care about. I don't care that much about, you know, whether this guy can play Stain in Cape Town and whether they lost four straight test matches in England last year. Where was that? Was that last year? Where was that? I mean, I don't even remember when last that was. Year. 2011. No. Yeah, I mean, I remember. I'm just worrying about this. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I remember very clearly. I'm just worried about whether this potential fan might be like, you know, I don't know. Samir, Samir, be careful what you say. This could be held against you that Samir does yeah. not remember when India lost to England. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no he's a lucky man. I'll say he's a lucky man. <laughs> no, I think I think that's the worry. If I mean, if there is a, if there is a negative answer to the question of whether Indian cricket is killing the IPL or whether you know whether this this uh, you know whether the poor performance will not have an effect on the IPL, it's because people will have stopped caring about international cricket. And I think if people stop caring about international cricket or stop caring about top class cricket, then that's not good news for the game. I mean, that's you know. That just means we have, you know, we have a factory for turning out T20 players, but not, you know, uh, but you know, but not a factory for turning out, uh, you know, for turning out Test class players anymore. And I think that's a great loss. I mean, we produced great Test players in the past. We never produced great Test teams, but we produced great Test players, and that's and we still have a part in the creating tradition to play. Okay, so on that note, uh, we will end today's hangout. Thanks a lot, Samir. Thanks, uh, Gora, for joining. And Thanks, uh, last plug-in for a fantastic book that Samir has written, A Brave New Pitch. Uh, guys, go and buy it. I've already done. I'm sure Gaurav has not, but now he'll say no, he has. No, I have. I have. I, I, I bought it. Uh, I bought it when it came in. I'm waiting for him to inscribe it yeah, when he comes in. Yeah. Okay, and Gaurav, and, and, and I want you to see, to, <laughs> and I want to see you write about it and to at least come up with one cartoon about the book. Sure, I'll do that, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cheers. Okay, Cheers, Anupam. Cheers, Thank you. Samir. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. Thanks for having me on, Anupam. Great doing Thank this. You. We should do Bye. more of these. Thanks, everyone, future. for joining in, and uh, we'll be back next week. Till then, take care. This uh, Anupam Bye. and Gaurav saying goodbye on Pitch Invasion. Stay tuned on our YouTube channel. We have loads of stuff coming up every day. Goodbye. Bye, guys. Bye.